love researching and writing and speaking on British history. It's my passion. I'm a historian with a PhD in history specializing in British history. And like all well-trained historians, we go to the libraries and the archives, the depositories of history. Instead, I have found while traditional research is invaluable, the best stuff may be found at the localities. I've worked in a lot of archives and loved every minute of it. I've worked at the National Library of Wales, the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, the Scottish National Archives, the Hampshire Record Office, the Gloucestershire Record Office, uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, the British Library in London, the National Archives, which are in a suburb called Kew of London, Stamford, Regional Library in Trowbridge, the Bodleian in Oxford, the Wiltshire and Swindon History Society and the National Archives. And I'm just amazed at what the value is. I'm not underestimating the importance of the archives. I take photos and notes, uh, organize these documents. I order them by putting in slips of paper or ordering them on the computer with an alphanumeric number and they're delivered to my desk. And the documents are interesting and maybe musty. My life experience has shown that the very best things I've ever found have been in the localities. A few years ago, I was in a village in Gloucestershire. It's in the Cotswolds, and somebody heard that I was a British historian and they gave me a tip. They said, you know, there's some people in the village that have a whole bunch of historical documents. Maybe you ought to go down and make an appointment. So I called to make an appointment and uh, asked if I could see their collection. And they were unsure about me, um, checked out uh, the internet to make sure that I was really a historian. And they asked what I'd like to see. I said, I don't really know. I just know that you have some documents. And so we agreed on a two hour appointment. So on a June bright, warm morning, I arrived at uh, their house for my two hour appointment. And uh, I got to meet some wonderful people. Eddie and Jenny Jewell um, and their grandson, Byron Hadley. And I was supposed to be there for two hours and I stayed a month and a half and found a stash of documents that were so wonderful that you could work on them the rest of your life. Perhaps the most important thing I found there uh, most interesting was a stash of love letters. They're over 200 years old. They started, the romance starts in 1802. And these love letters reveal an epic story between a lowly vicar named Reverend George Bissett and Lady Catherine Howard, the only daughter of the Earl of Suffolk and Berkshire. And these letters, of course, are private hands. They're not in any formal collection of documents. Um, and a tip from somebody in the village and help from local people helped me locate these. And I've spent many months of my life since then researching all the details of the letters. There's over 400 people mentioned. There's many social issues, descriptions of transport, six countries, robberies, evidence of the queen's body being rioted over to prevent her body from leaving London. There's unbelievable details. But at the heart of it is an epic love story. And the footnoting that has been done is extensive. And much of the footnoting has to have come from the archives and the libraries. However, um, when talking to the locals still has proven to be the most valuable path in this journey to letters. Now these letters sometimes can be frustrating because um, they're difficult to read if they're trying to save postage and they write crossways uh, because it costs more if uh, there was an extra page in there. And so I asked Mr. Jewell where did these letters come from and he has an interesting story for Lord Sherborne all of his life, all of his adult life, and he's born and raised in the village. And Lord Sherborne owned this massive manor house, and he died in 1982. And he had given um, most of his estate to the National Trust, a big charity that preserves history. And then after Lord Sherborne's death, he and other workers on the estate were ordered to empty out the large attics of this manor house. And he felt that um, throwing these things away, some of these things away, was not right. And he brought home 
uh, a stash of papers. And they, his wife wasn't very uh, help, ha happy about that. And they had stayed in his home and his grandson had worked on preserving and uh, organizing them. And uh, so um, it was a very exciting discovery. And this is a Regency era, era romance at the heart of it. And like novels of Jane Austen, you have people of different rank, different fortune, even different ages in this situation that have fallen deeply in love, but society is opposed to their marriage. And it is a wonderful story in and of itself. From uh, books and archival research, I found that the author of the love letters was the Vicar of Malmesbury Abbey. And here it is. It looks like it's in ruins, and indeed most of it is. It's a medieval abbey, but this part down here is very much still a parish church, and that's where he was the vicar for many years. And I was always looking for a portrait of him, and I didn't think one existed, because you can usually tell if one had existed at some point from research. It's either been sold or it's recorded somewhere, but he wasn't really important enough to ever have his portrait taken. And after many years, I had given up hope that we'd ever find a real image of George. And I was visiting the Abbey three times. On my third time, um, I had my research assistant with me and I was showing her where George was uh, the vicar and she, we were leaving and uh, she needed to go to the toilet, to the loo. So I was standing outside the loo waiting for her in this tiny little hall I had never been in before, despite having been to the Abbey and looked over every nook and cranny of it. Um, I look up in, at the wall and I said, oh my gosh, this is a big watercolor of the interior of the Abbey circus 1810. I'm like, Billy, get out of the loo. I think we have an image of George. And so this was something I found by hanging out at the localities of where his life occurred. And it may not be the most wonderful portrait, but I was thrilled to find it in the context of I always wondered if I could find the original of her portrait. I knew one of hers may exist, had to have existed at some point because there's a real poor quality um, image I found of her from a wood engraving. And uh, anyway, would I ever find it? Would I ever find the original? So I went to the source, I went to the locality. She was the daughter of the Earl of Suffolk and went to the Earl of Suffolk's brother, the uh, very recently deceased uh, Maurice Howard, the Honorable Maurice Howard, and he was kind enough to let me in his home, and he had a folder on her, but didn't know a lot about her, but he had a folder on her, and then above his dining room um, was a portrait of her brother, the man who becomes Earl, um, a portrait of her mother, the antagonist in the story, of her late brother, who was tragically killed as an adult in a hunting accident, which was part of the reason she has suffered such great anxiety in her life from some trauma like this hunting accident. So found these portraits, which were not in the public domain or known by anyone. And I always wondered if I'd find her portrait. And on my third visit to Maurice's home, uh, looking, he was letting me look in his curio case and he had a lot of miniatures of his family and I saw it, it was only about this big, and I said, Maurice, I think this is her, I think this is her. And sure enough, he pulled her out, and you can see on the back, Lady Catherine Howard, uh, painted by Hopner. And so that's been thrilling to be able to see her in her uh, beauty. In 1803, right after the romance started, it started in 1802. Now, the letters were found in a different county. The events occur in Wiltshire. And the letters are found in the neighboring county of Gloucestershire. So I return often to the village in which the letters are found. And after a couple of years, I was eight doors down, eight cottages down from where I had found the stash of Bissett love letters, talking to uh, Mrs. Margaret Shaw, whose husband had also worked for Lord Sherborne and had been one of the people that emptied out the attic. I didn't know that at the time. We were talking about something completely unrelated. And she says, Diane, as I'm leaving, I think I might have some letters you might be interested in seeing. Roy, her late husband, had taken them uh, from the skip, which is the trash, and um, brought them in. She said they've been here at the house in the store for 30 years. 
And the thrilling thing was the top letter I immediately knew was a visit letter. And it's the best letter ever. And here is Margaret Shaw. We've become friends, and I'm so grateful to her. The letter is extraordinary because it is late in their marriage. They eventually marry after 17 years. And George is performing the marriage ceremony of the Earl of Suffolk's heir to Lord Sherborne from my village, Lord Sherborne's eldest daughter. And uh, he performs that marriage and then describes the wedding ceremony to his wife in great detail. There's people in the letter that are also in some of my other research projects. It's an extraordinary find. And uh, things that are coming out of the village. I often go back to the village and when um, the National Trust, which owns much of the property and much of the village around it, heard I was a British historian and was gaining some expertise in the local history, they asked me if I would like to organize their documents. Of course I would. I'm thrilled with that. I would love to do that. And those documents also would have come originally from this house. And before Lord Sherborne's death, he gave a lot of things uh, trying to preserve his history to the National Trust. One of the many hundreds of things that are in there, objects and documents, I've been uh, organizing with the help of wonderful people uh, like Lauren Palmer and uh, Tim Barter has uh, asked me to work on these documents. And I took a photo of a cameo. It's about this big. It's a miniature in a frame. And it certainly looked like a Regency era a woman uh, in cameo. But I couldn't read the words on the back of it. And I was sad that day. I remember thinking, that's a bummer. I'm never going to know who that woman is because I can't read it. It's gone too long. It's faded. It sat on my laptop for about a year and a half. And one day I was flipping through and those images and thought, look at the back. I think I'll, I'll, I think I'll change the contrast, change the brightness, uh, sharpen it. And on the back, after I did those things, I noticed I could read it a lot better than my naked eye could. And that says Lady Kath Howard, Sherborne, which is the village it was found in, and Lady C. Bissett. And I was thrilled. Here's an, another image of her in the locality. Talking about localities, George Bissett's brother, William, was eventually the bishop of Raffo in Ireland, which is now an extinct diocese. It's merged with Derry. So I decided to go out to Ireland. This is just barely in the Republic of Ireland, very close to Northern um, Ireland, and went to see his cathedral, which is here in the background. And here are the family graves of the Bissets. He's not actually buried there because he died in Scotland and they buried him there. It was a very hot day in the summer of 2018. Couldn't really read the gravestones at all. But if you're persistent, you and if you wait for the light to be just right and you take pictures from every conceivable angle, you can find what those gravestones say. And here is uh, the bishop's wife, Jane Bissett. And thrilled to find out where she was buried, but mostly her name, because even the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography says her name is unknown. And uh, so caught this image. When you alter the photo, you can really read it well. And other things you feel on the other gravestones where you don't think there's anything. And if you put a little soil in it, and you wait for the light to hit just right, and you take from very, many different angles with your photograph, you can find what these gravestones say. And if we found um, another niece of his that didn't, we didn't know existed, and she had died at the age of 11. So I would encourage you to go to the localities, um, even if it's not local history. Go to the localities of where the documents came from or where the events occurred. And one of the important parts of the Bissett romance is that George, despairing that she won't marry him, decides to leave the kingdom probably forever to go with his brother-in-law to Ceylon. And his brother-in-law is the recent governor of an island off the coast of India, a small little island that's often overlooked today. It's called Sri Lanka. And he's there for nine years. They do write letters to one another while he's gone. Uh, here's one from Colombo in modern-day Sri Lanka. 
in August of 1812, where he says, I left because I thought I could get you off my mind, but I find that I can't. But the letters are very scarce because it takes one year from the time you write a letter and send it till you get a return. So about six months to get it delivered and about a six month return. So there's not much. And in the letters, they don't talk much about their lives, just argue about why they're not getting married. So every day that George worked, or seems like every day when he was in Ceylon, he worked with a man named the Honorable Thomas J. Twizzleton. Twizzleton, Twizzleton, I thought. Well, I wonder if we could find any documents in England about Twizzleton. And sure enough, Thomas J. Twizzleton was the son, the grandson, the uncle, the brother, and the father of Lord Sandseals. And so I went because his ancestors still live there and uh, is the current Lord Say and Seal. I went to Broughton Castle in Oxfordshire. And there I met uh, Martin Fines, the Honorable Martin Fines here on the left, who is the heir of Lord Say and Seal. Uh, Lord Say and Seal was born in 1920. And so I talked to Martin and within 10 minutes of me asking him if they might have any documents on Thomas James Twistleton, because I'm looking for uh, evidence of his life in Ceylon because he works with a guy named Bissett that I'm writing a book about. Within 10 minutes, he had me in his recently organized archives, and he said, our castle has stood here since the 1400s, but just recently have we organized our documents with the great help of a archivist named Kenneth Barker. And there, so quickly, I was holding letters from, he had written from Ceylon uh, in, in the time that George was there, between 1811 and 1820. And wonderful things were covered. They let me photograph them, which I'm very grateful for and, and transcribing those. But in the documents, uh, in those letters, are things I would never know. That Twizzleton and Bissett were, knew each other from childhood. That he, at that point, was gray-headed and old and wrinkled. And what his pay was, that he was getting 600 pounds uh, per year to work in Ceylon. And there's many other details. And so, I must say that I have a philosophy now of go to the localities. Go to the localities. If many of the treasures in the world are not necessarily in the archives. Don't overlook other sources. So I'm going to go to Sri Lanka, uh, formerly known as Ceylon, a former British colony where George lived as a missionary for nine years and as private secretary to the governor, uh, General Brownrigg, who was his brother-in-law. I will undoubtedly go to the archives in Sri Lanka. But I wonder what I'll find from the locals. I love researching and speaking and writing on British history. But like all well-trained historians, I go to the libraries and the archives. But I would encourage everyone doing research to go to the locality, ask questions, wait for tips to come your way, and see what the treasures and the thrill are in the localities.